This is Off Planet Radio. Once again, to Off Planet Radio, I'm Randy Moggins at offplanetradio.com, the website. You can find us on YouTube and uh, you can hit us on Facebook as well. Here we are into the dog days of summer, August 2017, and uh, leading up to some very big events in a summer that I guess you could call the summer of great content in ufology. And uh, we're going to talk about that because. Uh, these are core subjects that we've talked about on the show since 2009 when we began. And um, even though we go off into the wild tangents of the uh, webosphere, we still land back sometimes on the home course, which is the things that have to do with the, um, the strange, the unexplained, and the things that we really need to learn more about. So uh, welcome. Don't forget, again, to uh, check out the website at offplanetradio.com. My guest is one of the hardest working UFO filmmakers in the world. She's completed eight feature UFO movies in 10 years that received eight prestigious awards, which include five EB awards. I guess that's not extra biological entity awards. In the largest UFO film festival in the world, the International UFO Congress Convention. Her movies offer unrelenting explosive footage and evidence about crop circle phenomenon. Her conclusions after producing eight UFO crop circle movies was that crop circles are produced by counter rotating spinning plasma vortices coming out of the earth. That's really important. The spinning plasma vortices are layered with specific frequencies with distinct boundary conditions, including earth frequencies, water frequencies, sometimes human consciousness frequencies, when people pray or meditate inside of a crop circle, and sometimes ET frequencies, but not necessarily all of them in every formation. Um, her final film, Crop Circle Diaries, presents footage where spinning plasma vortices appear as balls of light and create a crop circle in seconds in both England and France. Um, she's done a phenomenal amount of work over the years in the areas of ufology and crop circles, and she is also one of the leading edges of science related to plasma energy and how this can be applied to alleviate world hunger and um, all of the ills that beset us as a result of, well, this lockdown system that we live in. Patty Greer, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Thank you. It's nice to finally see your mouth moving in person. Live. Yes, my lips moving. Gosh, who thought that? How are you? I'm great. I'm excited to get on this tonight because things are really busting out, aren't they? They certainly are. Yeah, we're. Um, this has been a this has been a long hot summer for uh, I think a lot of us in terms of what's going on in the world of ufology. And pardon me, my lighting is failing me, but we'll adjust it as we go. It's like changing the tires on a car when it's moving. Um, but what, what's been going on in ufology is quite phenomenal. I've called it the summer of discontent because it seems like the wheels are kind of falling off right now in a lot of directions, a lot of things going on. And uh, those will weave into the conversation as we go through the narrative in this program, Patty. Uh, let me ask you a question. It's, it kind of goes like, so what's a nice girl like you doing in ufology or how did you get started with this? How did you get interested and how did you become what I would consider to be the preeminent filmmaker in the area of crop circles? Wow. That was loaded. Thank you. I yeah, think. And thank you. Yes. 
Yep. <laughs> um, it was truly accidental, and they made me stop saying, hi, I am the accidental filmmaker, because the first few years, and now it's been 10, I own the camera, but I can still only tell you lens and door. You know, I'm untrained, but I've got a really good eye, really good ear, and all of a sudden when it looks good, sounds good, I say, come on, let's hit it. And it just works. But it hasn't been like I started this because I was always into ufology or crop circles. That was never the case. I was dealing with a really bad case of mercury poisoning from silver fillings, totally other show. And uh, I couldn't get anybody to heal me or certainly be my lawyer and talk about silver fillings in this country. So uh, it took me eight years to get the real test to finally sober up and get the mercury out of me. But um, during the course of those eight years, when I was peaking on mercury poisoning, like literally red zone, I made all these movies and moved into a place of being one crazy telepathic girl who just all of a sudden started banging out the movies. I didn't mean to, but I'm a really good listener. And when I was like dealing with something so different to my health, I just threw my hands up like surrender and this thing showed up that was so incredible, which was walking in a crop circle. I forgot about the poisoning. I was just all about my new moment and it started there and it, I, it's, it's finally slowing down. But that was it. So we're, what was the first crop circle that you actually engaged with? The first one? Yes, yeah. The first crop circle that you engaged with. I'm kind of putting it that way because I get the sense that you sort of intuitively knew there was some energetic involved with this. Yeah, I, I had also given up on human healing me from something that I guess we're not allowed to yet. Talk about flu vaccines and, uh, you know, I mean... All, oh, you can talk about it. anything here. I've, we've gone through vaccines and... Mercury and all the other forms, fluoride, chlorine, you name it. We talk but it's about the solutions now. You know, that's, that's where we're at is about solutions. And that's what my work yeah. is, is, you know, I didn't come in. You're right. I'm a nice girl. I didn't come in here to fight with bullies or have snakes biting at my ankles or, you know, yeah. Are you kidding me? And what's happening, I'm watching like every package, post office, UPS, I get it ripped open. Last week, I actually had Amazon directly send my editor a brand new master hard drive in the box because I was flying out there so he could hand it to me. And it arrived torn into. Oh my gosh. Now that's, that's so, a, the editor is the part of, that's part of your, your hardware that you're using to actually physically edit the stuff. So this is a, a hard disk drive. Yeah, it was just a, an external hard drive, but I okay. sent it to a man who was my editor okay. in another state just to do an update of Crop Circle Diaries. But what I've been through with just trying to get my data from him, two were stolen from the post office. One was like sent to somebody else's house, and it was still cut into at her door. Just so there's what's going on is that my eighth movie, the rest were practiced is so important scientifically and it's almost like i just want to focus there in case my computer falls off the table like you know how much everywhere with everything so i want to go to the deliciousness of crop circles that i never knew until 2014 when i was in a very strange way brought to meet penny kelly who was the real partner of william levengood have you known their work his work? Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with, with Levin Good, and I, I've heard Penny Kelly's name as well. I don't have all the background on it, so now you're going to fill us in on the background of this. Well, Penny Kelly is a total unknown until Crop Circle Diaries, and um, again, oops, something amazing happened. I was um, speaking at the International UFO Congress in 2014 on Valentine's Day. I'm like, how good could it be? I've got a great gig, and I had a standing ovation. It was really nice response. And afterward, this lady came up and said, you have to speak at my event in Michigan, some private thing. And so I just like 
She flew me out. I spoke at her gig, but it was really a piece of my puzzle because sitting on the couch the first night was a man I never met who said, would you be willing to take a drive with me? There's someone you need to meet. And I'm like, yeah, that's going to happen. Some guy I don't know in Michigan, where I, you know. So right, I said, right. let me ask around about you. And uh, the next night, I met him again at the corner of the couch. And I said, people like you. People know you. And I gave your license of your car to two of my friends. Let's go. You know, again, I run my pendulum. And if it says, hell yeah, I go. It said, hell yeah. So I get in the car. We're talking. Nice guy. He still doesn't tell me who this woman is. And I meet Penny Kelly. And we spend four hours around her kitchen table at this stretched out B&B that goes on forever. <laughs> and um, she works her tail off. There's cows, there's chickens, there's turkeys. I mean, I don't know how she does it. She's even older than me. <laughs> but here she is, the most brilliant mind that worked with Lefty for the last 16 years of his life. And she is so humble that we almost lost the science. But this guy takes me to her house four hours we're sitting around a round table eating cherries talking about interesting things but not crop circles so i said god i hate to do it nice to meet you but i've got to go because i have to speak first thing in the morning so she says well let me give you one of my books and she hands me a book i didn't see the cover i just went through the pages and there's crop circle notes i said crop circle notes what are they doing in your book and she looks at the guy and she said you didn't tell her who I was? And I said, who are you? I've been here four hours. And she said, I was the real partner of Lefty for the last 16 years of his life. I was the one in the lab. It was not BLT, Nancy Talbot. It was not Burke. It was Lefty and Penny Kelly for the last 16 years. And Lefty, who's Levengood, that's his, what they call him, uh, had a big fight with Nancy Talbot in 1998. They had this out and separated and he never spoke with her again. Penny, who would never say anything mean about anyone, kind of jokingly said, oh, he made me call her once and that was it. You know, so they didn't resonate. And when I talk about those of us that don't get along, I don't mean anybody's better or worse. It's, I think it's really now a matter of resonance. Yeah. I resonate in a frequency. I live in the woods. I've got a fox, not a dog or a cat. I've got raven that scream in the morning and I don't feed them. So, you know, I live in a different resonance where when I go to town, I feel uncomfortable, edgy. It's like I'm almost um, too telepathic to go and be in public anymore. I feel almost socially unacceptable mm -hmm. and dangerous because I, I sense more than I want to. So I move quickly and I get back to the woods. Yeah, that's called being so wide I'm, open. You're wide open. Huh? You're wide open. The empathic yes. opens up and, and basically it becomes overwhelming after a while. It's why I don't go to conferences very often. When I do go, I go see speakers, I meet a few people, and I leave because I can't take the energy of large crowds anymore. Well, I did enjoy being a speaker until recently when the frequency really shifted and the control really changed. And um, I actually just turned down a really good gig at Mount Shasta. They called me early on. It was a really nice girl who I'd met, but I didn't know she worked for Full Disclosure Now and uh, Roger Ramsar. I didn't know that she was part of that group. She was this lovely girl, horses, North California. And so she called me after the gig and said, hey, we're doing this great conference in Mount Shasta and we'd love for you to be a speaker. And I didn't realize, oh my God, now I've looked at the menu. <laughs> But I run my pendulum, it's like, I can't swear, but it was like a no, a very large no, you're not going. And because um, I feel like there's really physically dangerous things happening now, um, personally yeah, to me absolutely. twice, but I can't. Absolutely. I need to be careful what I say, but I've been really inconvenienced by somebody having toys that they shouldn't have their hands on, in my opinion. And I don't think I'm making it up, but because I can't show you a screenshot of the photo of somebody holding something, you know, I have to be careful what I say, but I'm not going until things really change. And for me, it was fantastic to do um, contact in the desert for three years. Uh, the crowd is 
so appreciative. So many nice people. So what if it's 112 degrees, you know, uh, we're really busy, we move around. But all of a sudden the frequency changed. And my rooms were always full. I kept getting bigger room next year, but I always got a teeny amount of money and never a flight. But I was so grateful, like anybody would be, to be a speaker there. But I say, seriously, how about a little respect here? I mean, come on. And again, I'm grateful. But this year, after mentioning how something was really dangerous last year for me, I, they didn't call me to speak, which I didn't expect they would, nor would I want to. All of a sudden, I see my name on the poster. And I thought, what the heck? And um, interestingly enough, I also saw my name on the poster for Roswell. Oops, that was an accident. But, and I spoke there three years. So there's weird, constant weird, careless, but it's intentional. So here I am on their poster and I called them up and I said, hi, am I speaking? Well, of course you are. I, I said, well, that's great. I mean, I'm on the poster, but was anybody going to tell me or ask me or send a contract? And um, it, it came back that the lady that's really changed, is all I'm going to say politely, had supposedly told them, oh, we had a great talk. Never happened. Not even close. And um, so it got very strange. And I still had to really think about it because it doesn't feel safe to me physically. And so uh, I kept really holding out. And finally, I said, you know, I got to do it for the people because there's, it's really important. There's nobody else talking about crop circle science. There's definitely people that are talking about Doug and Dave. Hey, look at Doug and Dave or God bless ancient aliens. Thanks for doing your new crop circle show. But they went in May and hired a human crew intentionally six weeks before the season last year. So for me, it's like, can you talk to the real crappies? Not the reporters or the talking heads that yeah. are on all your other shows, but how about real crop circle people? Yeah. And I'm leaving this, subject. I mean, whew, it's, it's not the real organic stuff. And that's where me with no training, that's where I bring it, is because I took my camera into the crop circles and I lived in them like a mercury poison crazy person. I couldn't get enough. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just point something out here. You talked about how the, uh, the vibration has changed specifically with places like Contact in the Desert. And you wouldn't know this, but back in, I wanna say, late winter, early spring, we did a show on this, on, on Off Planet Radio. My co-host tonight, Emily Moyer, who's not here with us tonight, um, with a person named Elisa E, who was a survivor of MK Ultra, who, who in the course of that interview talked about, um, an encounter she had at the conference in Laughlin. And I want to say this was probably in 2012 where she was abducted. And as a result of that, we did pretty much almost a half hour on specifically UFO convention safety, because all of us have had experiences of being in the public venue in places like this and experiencing all of these interactions with, let's face it, spooks, and people that do not have your best interests at heart. So you wouldn't know that in bringing up what you brought up about safety in terms of these conferences and how there seems to be an escalated risk now for people that are attending these conferences, specific certain ones hosted by certain people and featuring another group of people that, shall we say, look a little bit murky to me and you. Well, I'm under contract for 10 years with um, the group right. that had the white tent and it said hiring on all four corners. And there was also another booth for Scientology, which is an interesting thing yeah. that hardly anybody noticed, but yeah, hello, other frequencies. Yeah. So what Big we have, nothing, not saying they're right or wrong, better or worse than what I'm doing, but we have very different frequencies of consciousness yeah. and very different intentions. I came into this to heal my gosh darn body. I didn't come into this 
because I wanted to be a crop circle speaker or a UFO anything or in movies going, hi, my family and neighbors. Yep, I've gone overboard. I'm saying it in a movie. I mean, <laughs> wait, you want to you wanna clear a room at a party? Ask me what I do in front of people. It is the greatest interesting. I mean, I don't put myself in that position. I only go to conferences usually to be social and I love it. But there's too much infiltration now and dark frequency, which, um, and again, it's not that there's anything wrong with Mount Shasta, but I'll be damned if I'm going to put myself up there as a moving target. End of story. Well, you know, and I know, you know, and I know both that there are places, Shasta is certainly one of them. Joshua Tree, I can tell you, because I've been out there, is extremely intense. And whether you, you say someplace is positive or negative really doesn't have anything to do with it. It's the amplification of the frequencies. I mean, this goes right into the whole crop circle dynamic as well, because we're dealing with places in the earth that themselves are energetic vortexical systems that amplify energy and create vector scale events. Whether it's crop circle, whether it's apparitions, whether it's UFOs showing up, I mean, anybody that has been in this field long enough has experienced this if they've done field work. So, it, you know, it isn't a question of, well, that place is dark or not. Yeah, there's dark stuff goes on in Shafta. There's Shasta, there's spirits there. There's spirits of Joshua Tree, too. And when those things are harnessed in certain ways, um, one needs to either be really well shielded or use advisement in attending. You would laugh if you saw the triple mylar wrap, two of them behind my chair, I taped behind me. <laughs> and I'm gonna say something that I won't regret because I'm not gonna name names, but I was concerned last year when I was on stage and I always get picked for the final night panel. That's a compliment. David mm -hmm. Wilcock chose me to be the girl on his panel and I'm sitting between Five guys. Jim Mars was one of them. Love you, Jim. Love you, Jim. <clears throat> yeah. yeah those he don't was... know we're recording this today after Jim Mars has departed the Earth sphere. Beautiful yeah. man. So honest. I grabbed his hand so many times to sit with Winston Stroud to say, history's changing. You got to hear this. But at Isetti, I didn't let Jim go. I mean, I was like, when I get on a mission, when I know there's Mr. Historian that needs to know this, it's what I do. And I really took time with Jim. And uh, that man had an ear. He could listen. He has a heart. He can feel. But the funniest thing that probably nobody else knows is that he has a cannon parked at the top of his dive driveway, cocked and locked and ready to rock. And his <laughs> grandson knows how to use it. <laughs> and has pointed down the driveway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So I want to finish this contact in the desert. We have so many fun stories. I, I like it that we're cracking up and keeping it light, yep, you know, keeping it light. but it's pretty heavy. So the gig, which I, I really like going there, it's my third year, I've got a great following. And all of a sudden it's May and I get a call from the lady that runs the event and she's talking really fast. Now I've known her three years and she used to be a very calm, Buddhist and all of a sudden she's talking really fast. She's saying things that are so unlike her. And I'm like, I think it's her. And she says, I just want you to know that I'm three speakers over and I need to pull three speakers and you're one of them. Sorry, you're not gonna speak this year. Now we've got a signed contract. We've already been through, um, am I speaking? Well, of course you're speaking. She said, you know, you guys had a great conversation to which I said, wow, that never happened. So now she calls me and pulls me from the gig now that I've been promoting it. To which I said, seriously, after what I went through last year on stage, which was, I got hit twice and I left the stage. Cameras, lights, I got hit. I saw it happen. I had a friend taking photos. It's not okay. And I left the stage in front of thousands of people on the David Wilcock panel. I am not playing. I didn't come in here to be treated like this, and I'll be damned if I'm going to go on stage anytime soon until we're not playing this game. It's not okay. 
I'm willing to say it publicly because it's really not okay. And people don't know how bad it is. I don't want to play the woman card, but does this happen to men? I don't know. Well, let me ask, when you say you got does hit. Does it? Oh, yes, it does. When you say you got hit, what does that mean exactly, Patty? Um, so are we talking I was sitting there on the panel waiting for... Uh, energy weapon? No, I think it was an energy weapon. I think... Okay. Yeah. But again, yeah. I can't say for sure anything. All I know is... Um, I saw somebody close by who I felt very uncomfortable and I had already told security the day before, if he's, if, you know, if that's right in front of me, it's too close. Don't make me go public and say something to thousands of people. Don't put me in that position. I, and all of a sudden I'm on stage and I jumped. It felt yeah. like I am yeah. so yeah. imagining this, but I don't get nervous. I'm sitting there with David Wilcock and the boys and Jim Mars, who I love and, and uh, Gordon Asher Davidson. And then on my other side was two guys that never smiled, Nick Forrester and um, Robert Bouval. And Bouval was amazing because he did his five minutes for about 20. And then David asked him a question and he went on for another 15. <laughs> yeah, sounds like Bouval, yeah. Uh-oh. All right, so that was interesting. Just uh, the system just glitched and dropped you right out there, Patty. So these things happen to the nicest people, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't want to elaborate much because it's too scary of a subject, but I did leave the stage while cameras were rolling, which, you know, to me, that's a that's too heavy for me to have to tolerate. So punchline was when I got called right before, uh, a month before contact by the lady who said, I've got to pull you from the gig. I, I was like, are you serious? I'm about to go to the UFO Congress. They already whispered you won best film for Crop Circle Diaries. So I'm going to be up on stage. Oh, I guess I won't be mentioning I'm speaking at your event. Uh, really? So sure enough, yeah, we're, we're, you're pulling you, you're, you know, so I was just stumped. So I get to the UFO Congress, where I also won People's Choice with quite a pile of people. I mean, my work is really honest and important, you know, to save the goddamn food supply. Excuse my language. It's not to fight or it's not even a conspiracy. It's a scientific phenomenon that's real. But to have to go through that on stage and then to be pulled from a gig. Um, so here I am sitting at the UFO Congress, totally different gig a month before. And eight or 10 people came up to my table and said, oh, can't wait to see you speak next month. And I said, oh, not happening. I got fired. What? And I said, yep, pulled. I mean, what can I say? Pulled. So three people or two people told me they bought a ticket to my private workshop where they have to pay money. And that's where I drew the line. So I called them up on the phone sitting at my table. And if you saw who I brought with me for security, I don't bring guys with um, knives and guns and weapons. Like, I love it when David comes in with his guys or Stephen Greer comes in with his guys. I come in with psychics. And one of them is just a gosh darn voodoo mama. She is, oh my God. So I had these two amazing power women sitting next to me. They were my security guards. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, that's how I got back on stage last year was three women um, did a triangulation of the person that did this. They didn't even know each other. But three psychic women, all sitting in different places, made something happen, and all of a sudden, that person got up and left the, I mean, I don't want to say too much, but it was real, it happened, I saw it, and thank God, Robert Babal is still going on and on and on. <laughs> so it was quite a thing to tolerate, but then getting pulled, I was like, this is not okay. It's just not okay. I promoted the gig. I'm, a, I'm the only one doing crop circles, unless they bring back from the, you know, from the crypt, uh, <clears throat> Colin Andrews, you know, who did take money from um, yeah. Yeah. Lawrence Rockefeller. God bless him, he's a nice guy, but you know, I've been told by enough people, but he's the one that's proving crop circles are fake, Oliver's Castle's fake. My movie Crop Circle Diaries proved beyond a doubt it's real. So as much as I want to be respectful, it, 
So anyway, he's speaking at a gig by Skype in November. I thought that was cool. They're bringing him back. But it's not about insulting anyone. It's about telling the updated truth. Not what we knew in the 90s before we woke up, but there is better information. And nobody in the field, for some reason, wants to watch Crop Circle Diaries. Or if they have, nobody's really acknowledged it in the Crop Circle world. It is so interesting that, that we don't want to say, how can we work together? That's why you are so important, because we're working together. I've got the data. You've got the audience. This is how we win. Yeah, that's exactly how we win. And it is exactly that right now. It's all division. And that division isn't coming from people like yourself and people like Robert Baval or, or Jim Mars or the people that have been in the field for a long time. There's a whole wave of people that have come into this. As you said, the frequency, is, the frequency has changed. The energy has shifted. And quite frankly, you know, I just go back to the article that started the shit storm that was the summer of Corey Good which was when I posted in April. I mean, Bill Ryan at Project Camelot picked it up, used it to fulcrum off to do three hours with dark journalists. And from there, I can tell you what the responses have been all summer long. And I said, then, this is a dark energy that has entered this, this field. And do we name names? Well, I'm naming the name right now. Corey Good and the people behind him. You don't have to name those names. I can do that. The only time I name those names is when I talk about the fact that I'm stuck in a 10-year contract for, I have to look for the word, it's distribution, but it's really been suppression. <laughs> and um, I, I'm stuck for 10 years. I brought five different lawyers. My fifth was recent. And uh, it was uh, Pat Fuscogna who got John Burroughs, the Rendlesham guy, got him the first UFO win in history in court. That was my fifth lawyer. And when we were done, he said, I've never been so creeped out in my life. And I warned him. I said, this won't be fun, and, but I'll give him $2,000 to end my 10-year contract because who wants zero income year after year after year? And an exclusive contract means they can exclusively suppress me. So my question today, was what is so different about me and Corey and David? And I don't blame Corey and David, but my question is, because Corey went public, Gaia has spent millions of dollars promoting the show. Now, when I got a call from India, hello, do you have your Gaia subscription yet? I remembered going, is this one of your trolls or is this really India? I mean, I was like, you know, nothing would surprise me, nothing at this point, but that's how hard they're trying to get people everywhere to get into that thing and watch it every week. And you know, I like David, I met him once uh, in person and we started talking and seven hours later we quit. I mean, we fascinated each other and I just kept saying, I'll give you one, you give me one. And it, it got good. Yeah. And God, I wish I hadn't promised to not repeat the best ones, but I did promise. So. You know what I'm saying? It's like and you keep your promises. That that's that's the thing about you. Well, I think if we can, you know, act with integrity in this field, perhaps we can set an example. But um, you look like the singled out person if you say no to your own free or free. Yeah, they don't pay the women uh, their own TV shows. And I didn't mean to say that. Perhaps um, Regina gets paid nicely or Paula gets paid nicely. I don't know. But when I got called, because they wanted a crop circle show, um, their producer, who also produces Coast to Coast, which I always want to go on because it's a big audience. And George treats me really nicely, and Richard Serrett does Coast to Coast Canada. Jimmy Church will not talk to me. He won't even let me on his, his local church show, you know. Um, <laughs> Jimmy Church. Uh, we call Jimmy the social enforcer of ufology. Uh, that was Cliff High's official <laughs> name for him. <laughs> Jimmy. I really you, want to like him. No, he's a hard you ass know? is what he is. He's a hard ass. And, and I don't, I, I'm not, because I get accused of, wait, well, you're just jealous. Actually, I'm not. I really like my gig and I like the independence that I get to do this kind of thing. But I will say that there is a certain cachet 
amongst the coast to coast crowd that's it's 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 a little too chummy and close for me in terms of who gets on and sometimes how long they even stay on because i've had people I interview people after they've been on coast to coast and they go, yeah, it was really weird. They went, I said something and they went, oops, commercial break, boom. And then the lines dropped. And the next thing I know, circuit cut and they're off to another guest. Like they just dropped somebody right in. So there's a lot of machinery in the background of this that doesn't show up when you're listening to the broadcast. Cause I, I listened to it when Art Bell was there. I listened to it for ever until the last five years when I just went, I'm done with this. But it's, it's not to take on that whole thing so much as the cults of personality that have grown up around ufology and have now evolved into what I will call a new religion in terms of what is being perpetrated by comic disclosure. I'll just leave it at that. Well, I'm concerned, again, about a lot of the people in the field because they seem different to me after their experience yeah. there. Yeah. And um, so I want to finish the story about contract in the desert. Some people yes. call it conflict in the desert. <laughs> <clears throat> I was grateful to be invited, kind of. But then what happened was I got fired, kind of. But then I called from my table with all these people saying, can't wait to see you speak. And I'm saying, wow, sorry. But then when the people said we bought uh, tickets to your workshop, that's where I had to draw the line. And sure enough, when I called them and said, I'm about to win Best Feature Film in two nights. Um, there's 1,500 people here. We're all chums. I'm going to have to tell 1,500 people that you played mean. <laughs> I mean, you know, sorry, I won't be there. They fired me for no reason uh, that I knew of at that time. So. Um, I called back and I said, uh, you know, I got 1,500 people here and, and I'm kind of not in a good mood about this. So sure enough, she said, yeah, I'm really sorry. She let you go. She had to. I said, had to. Interesting. So five minutes later, not even five, I'm sitting there with my power women and I see the phone and I said, it's Joshua Tree. And we just started laughing and I said, stop snickering. Hello. And so she said, they want you to speak. So they threw me back in, but they tried to take away my guest pass and they wouldn't give me my normal room for two. It all of a sudden turned into uh, less and less. And then I said, well, I've already invited a guest who is really encouraging me to go. And frankly, why does everybody have a flight there and I don't? What is this? It's not like I'm some lackey or beginner or deserve to be disrespected. And this is why I'm speaking out. Like you said in the beginning of the show, I'm a damn nice person. I tell the truth. I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and years making these films. And I'm tolerating three different distributors, all complete suppression boys. And they're connected with MUFON. So all of this just keeps building where they're all in this icky pile. And I trusted them because I was high on mercury poisoning and I thought distributors distributed. So I didn't have a clue. But the contact in the desert, they hire me back and they stick me at a sh terrible hotel a few miles down the road with my friend. And then I get my table to sell stuff and it's right at the top of the hill where the only generator running the whole event is spewing fumes. Oh. So. I tolerated it one day, but the next morning I asked the great volunteers, could you just lift this table and move it to the opposite side? And they did. Mm. So, um, you know, but I had to make my own bed. But the worst thing was it's my third year. And Victoria, oops, the lady running it knows that I don't do mornings. So I open up the schedule and guess when they put me on? 7.30 Sunday morning after Jimmy Church's yeah. big party. And everybody's always up at 7.30 to go to a speaker the night after they've been partying down with Jimmy Church, yeah. So the interesting thing was I slept well because even though I was on the Jimmy Church panel with Nick, uh, Nick Pope, um, Richard Dolan, Linda Moulton Howe, and um, we're sitting on a panel and 
when it ended, Richard looked at me and he had no idea that I was, you know, who I am, that I knew things and that I could speak so clearly. It was really nice hearing him give me an authentic compliment. And it was funny because he seemed kind of surprised. And it was like, yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> and then Jimmy Church put on uh, Facebook, uh, Patty knocked it out of the park, but we expected that. But the funny thing was my table was next to theirs for all three days. They forgot to invite me and my guests to the big party. Mm hmm we were the only ones not invited. And it's not like I'm like wham wham or victim. It's just like, so who made you do that? Because Jimmy's a good guy. Reed is really nice. And both of them came up after the, um, the panel and said really nice things to me, but they could have said, oh, by the way, our address is, and it's at nine or, you know, it's all good. But to me, that's kind of like, yeah. So, I get up the next morning at 7.30 and I get to the venue and they didn't put me in a small room where at 7.30, you know, people, you know, intimate. Instead, they put me in the sanctuary, the big, huge room. And I'm guessing, you know, perhaps I would look like I couldn't gather a crowd or something. I don't know. That's maybe worst case thinking, but I get there and it was like 50 degrees. The room was so cold that both the sound men were wrapped in blankets. And I said to the sound men, What's with the cold? And he said, I'm not really sure. Orders came down that we had to take the um, air conditioning all the way to the bottom and leave last night. So the room was really cold. And I said, do you have any funk music? And he said, yeah. And I said, what's your name? He said, James. I said, James, when I get up there with my little Madonna headset mic on and I say, hit it, James, you start at eight and then you bump it to 10. Yeah? And I, uh, okay, so I get up there and I've got my embroidered jacket. I'm looking all, you know, senior, elegant, you know, like conservative. Uh, I don't know if I could look conservative, but, you know, I kept my cool. And all of a sudden I said, uh, James went up and introduced me. And then he said, uh, boy, everybody's just going to have to cuddle up to somebody next to you because, sorry, headquarters told us to freeze the room, so we did. And so I got up on the stage and I said, uh, okay, everybody stand up, please. James, hit it! And the music went on, and it was the best funk. And I said, we're going to make this room warm. And people kept pouring in. And I had a packed house, and everybody danced. And the room got like 15, 20 degrees warmer. Everybody's like wide awake because our blood is moving. And it was a fantastic talk. But it shouldn't be that hard, should it? Well, no, what it sounds like to me is it sounds like a, a psychological warfare. I'll be very honest with you, and I think you know this, that those are the kind of things that are done. And I, and I noticed this about people in ufology. And uh, let's just say that certain high profile names are very good at politics because I've met them. They can be very nice to your face, but they also do these strange things like, forget your name or how to pronounce it, or they forget to show up for an interview timely. And then when they show up, they're, they're not really sober. And I'll just leave it at that. But let's just say that that's my experience and I'm sticking to it. So yeah, it's psychological warfare. It's basically a way of marginalizing somebody else to make somebody else much bigger, which is part of the game in this whole this whole theater. And I, right. I heard stories from Contact in the Desert, and so did everybody else, that there's a lot of shenanigans going on, some of it kind of dark and mystical, and some of it's just the normal human shit that people do when they're away from home at a conference or an event like this. And it's, you know, it's okay, we're humans, we can do that. But some of it isn't, some of it is politics. And that's what I found in this field, and it's the thing that turn me off against conferences and turn me off against the high profile people, specifically certain types because of the polit political games that they're playing. This is a field that needs to be cohesive. It's not a huge yes. part of the population. And we have a lot to prove to people out there. And people have made extraordinary claims, some of them with, let's just say negative proof, some a little bit of proof, and then people come along that have spent years doing journeyman work and they get marginalized. And that's the part of all this that really sucks. Yeah. Well, the punchline of that story is that I am dear friends with 
somebody that helps them run the event, a very, very good, honest person. And um, on the last day, in the last few hours, this guy comes up to my booth with Alfred Lambermont Weber on the phone, and he goes, Patty, Alfred's on the phone, and um, he's got a really important question for you. And I've, I've got a line. When I came out of the freezing room, I had the longest line to buy my films that I have ever seen. Everybody wants autographs. I'm like, seriously? You know, um, so it was, it was such a gift, you know, to be able to make lemonade yeah. uh, with so much sugar in it and then have people drink it so well and everybody's healthy or not dead. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like it's any kind of brain science to really figure out where the problem is and who's at it and what's going on. But I think it's gonna need to be third and fourth graders that we bring in that don't have any training in, um, neg in uh, false narrative. I mean, they're not wiped yet. They're not completely fluoridated yet. Let's bring in some children and I'll give them all 643 of my screenshots of physical evidence of hacking. And I bet they're gonna go, well, that's easy, follow the money. Um, there. You know, I mean, it's so easy. Anyway, so this great friend that's helping them run the event was very kind to me. And Alfred, his question was, um, you need to get Patty on the phone. So I've got a table lined full of people. And he, what, Alfred? I'm really busy, but I, you know, I love you guys. You do really important work and, you know, we're a pipeline. Yeah. And I happen to be the hub and a wheel, I guess, because I'm in the center and I don't hold things back when they need to be shared. I'm the worst person anybody could lie to or dishonor. Worst person, because I'm honest about it. It's not like I make stuff up, I don't have to. So Alfred wanted to know, and this is a question that didn't come from me, I heard Gaim bought Contact in the Desert. And I was like, really? Well, it wouldn't surprise me because I got the big, huge white tent and you know the signs yeah. hiring, hiring on all four sides and the vacuums. Oops. Um, anyway, it is like a giant vacuum. <laughs> um, and then Scientology's over there with their vacuum, you know, to the field. And here's all these innocent, wonderful people that, you know, they just want to know. And so it's, you know, it's hard for me to say, I am the mother, because I don't want to be that. But it's like, you know, we do need to have something we can trust. If we're going to be teaching a lot of kids, it sure would be nice not to have a um, guru, but rather, people that are talking to you like an equal. So this wonderful man, I had to sneak in the back of the Corey Good talk. And as a speaker, you know, it was easy to get in anything, which was really nice. So I get in the back because I knew the event was about to end and I had to ask this guy because Alfred was really wanting to know. And so I whispered to my friend in the back of the room, just tell me, did Guy and buy the event? And he looked at me and he said, I don't think so, no, no, no. Mm -mm. And I said, um, well, uh, anyway, I said, so who got me fired? Who put me on at 730? How did that happen? And he looked right at me and he said, well, Guy was in control of who speaks and who doesn't. And Victoria was in charge of the schedule. And we all wondered why, because she didn't have experience. But it was the two of them working together to create the perfect schedule and to decide who needed to get cut at the last minute. So I was told that, I'm not writing my own material. I, I was told that from somebody very credible. And so it's like, okay, so what did I do wrong to Gaia? Gaia now, new name. What did I do? I complained in the beginning because it seemed like an awful lot of my royalties slipped away to another group called Gravitas. The only time I saw an itemized statement was once. And there was this huge deduction to uh, somebody, you know, and I was like questioning, you know, I wanted to know, why am I getting 50% of this teeny bit that's left out of how great this is? Oh my God, you guys are great. My stuff is flying. And this is in the beginning, 2011. And, um, so they started getting bothered that I was questioning things and that I cared about my income, God forbid. And so all of a sudden, this man wrote the entire team and said, nobody speaks to Patty Greer anymore. Everything comes directly to legal. And his name was Sam Tolls. 
And so Sam got the entire staff royalty to no longer talk to me. And I was like, wait a minute, that's not fair, that's not nice. And now we're on the fourth royalty person, you know, in the first few years. They come, they go, they come, they go. And um, now I can't talk to anyone. I was like, well, that's not, and his letters were not nice, not friendly. And it was basically, we're sick of your complaining. We're sick of giving me, you're terrible. You're, you know, and I was like, wait a minute. I hired you to distribute my movies. All of a sudden, and I only can guess, I disappeared from the Guy MTV platform. I disappeared from their catalog and they stopped selling my films. And it was only maybe one year that they just did a huge job, but it was to get back what they paid me up front. And once they did that, I disappeared. And I'm still disappeared today, six and a half years later, and I can't get rid of them, no matter how good the lawyer is, unless I sign a gag order. And I put in writing, you need to stop hacking me. And they responded, we have every legal right to continue electronic monitoring due to your defamatory statements. What? So when my lawyer- wait, no, 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 wait a minute. Let's stop. Let that breathe for a minute. You're, yeah, tell right? me, you're telling me that they believe they have the right because of a contract you have with them for distributorship to leg legally, electronically surveil you and your correspondence and your transmissions, and what else are they doing? I mean, do they have private detectives? Uh, that's about the creepiest thing. You know, of all the things that I've heard, and a lot of it I still can't confirm, that's by far the creepiest thing I've heard yet, Patty. Well, it's been pretty creepy, and that was when the lawyer said creepiest people he's ever dealt with, same word. Um, we have every legal right to uh, uh, electronic monitoring due to her defamatory statements. So I had offered $2,000 and um, the response was they needed $2,124 and 34 pennies. I said to my lawyer, that's adorable. We're going to deliver it in pennies in a Brinks truck and drop it in front of the place. $2,134 and 24 pennies. Everything is pennies. So I said, fine, fine, give it to them. He goes, well, that's not all. There's also, and then he read me the gag order or he sent it and I was like, yeah, that's gonna happen, never. And it was my favorite one that came up, it seemed like a couple times, is you can never come back and sue us for what you don't know we're doing today. Now I'm rewording it, but ultimately that's what it said. And then, um, so I wasn't gonna get my no hacking. I wasn't gonna get I'm certainly not gonna sign a gag order because honesty is too important. I'm not gonna gag for something that didn't work in the least. So I said to my lawyer, thank you for your time. We are so done. And um, that was it. And we completed it at uh, December 28th, 2015. And um, I don't know if it has anything to do with what happened to me in 2016, but what happened to me, and I'm not saying it was them, but somebody paid a damn fortune to have me hacked in 2016. It was, well, it was hundreds and hundreds of screenshots of unbelievable hacking. And like you said in the beginning of the show, I'm a nice girl. I did not come in this to banter with bullies and have people try and steal every possibility of me making money or more important, getting the information out. Let's go to the information that for some reason, somebody doesn't want to get out because this is well, that's why what I want to do. I'm doing. Let, uh, you know, and I think I think we kind of got to that place. Why don't we take a break here? Um, this is normally where we kind of take a, a one hour break, cut the segments, and come back on the other side of this. And let's talk about let's talk about the technology and the things that have grown out of your work and the films and all the positive, great, good things that can come out of this. And We'll do all of that when we come back on the other side with my guest, Patty Greer. We'll be right back to Off Planet Radio. Where am I? What happened? I feel really odd. Oh my God, I passed out in a crop circle. How long have I been here? What are those beams of light in the sky? seen them before.
So what is this pattern I'm sitting in? What's the crop circle message? On the ground, all I see are triangles and cubes, but the electromagnetic energy is definitely enhanced. I've got goosebumps all over my body from head to toe. The top of my head is tingling. I feel dizzy, looking around like I'm spinning in a vortex, a tornado of blended enhanced frequencies. This must be crop circle magic. I first met Dr. William Levengood in maybe 1996, 97, when he wrote or read a book that I wrote, and it was about Kundalini, and he was looking for people who had unusual energies. It wasn't about me, it was about the science. It was about the the work, the amazing work that he was doing. And he was under great pressure at that time. Um, he had been researching crop circles since about, mm, probably 1989. So it had been about eight years and he had, you know, he had quite a bit of, of evidence that he had compiled. Many of the sacred geometric crop circles when spun show us propulsion technologies. And he said to me, there's no way, no way a Doug or a Dave or somebody could fake the crop circle phenomena. There's no way you can melt the cellulose in a whole field um, and make those plants bend over the way they do and then keep growing. There's no way that you could fake elongated nodes or what he called expulsion cavities when the node blew out. There's no way to fake molten iron ore in the middle of the field, you know, in the middle of the night. And he said most of the crop circles are real. Here we have these three lights flying over a field that it's not just forming a crop circle. In analyzing it frame by frame, there are ripples that are moving out like throwing a rock in a pond. When Patty reversed it or slowed it down, she actually revealed the communication, which is instantaneous. When you have plasma, plasma communicates almost instantly. It travels immediately everywhere. And that's just one of the features of plasma. circles are coming out of the earth. They're not coming out of the sky. These spinning plasma vortices are made up of different frequencies with distinct boundary conditions. Periodically human consciousness is involved. Sometimes we also include the frequencies of other dimensional beings from distant planets. All frequencies carry information, and all plasma communicates. Crop circles are created by counter-rotating vortices that arise due to the interaction between energy frequencies flowing through the Earth and moving through the atmosphere. They meet, they interact, and the result is a visible energetic picture of the information that they carry.